All right, we're going to try this again with another session of GM tips, and hopefully I'm going to go back through combat a little bit more since you guys couldn't hear yesterday, and I'm going to add a little bit more into it. So one of the things we're going to talk about uh, with any system, and, and I'm going to be using specifically the D20 style systems, so you're looking at your Dungeons and Dragons, you're looking at your Star Wars D20 probably, you're looking at Pathfinder, you are looking at, uh, in some cases, some of the other systems that have similar mechanics to it. That could be D20 Modern, D20 Future, and it'll bleed a little bit into Savage Worlds and that. So I'm sorry if there's some other systems there that uh, won't get covered, but this is going to cover a lot of, of what a standard combat turn will be. And a turn is composed of 10 rounds, and each individual round has basically two types of, of, of ways it can go action-wise. <clears throat> One is a standard action plus a move action, or it could be a full round action with a five-foot step. And so I wanted to go through this a little bit with you and the type of different actions that you can take for each one. And as a GM, it's very important that you understand this mechanic because it's important. It, your players will be doing a lot of different things. So let's first look at a dive down on the standard actions. And that's really important. Standard actions, they have a nice chart in page 183 of the Pathfinder books that has these actions. Now, each of your game um, master books should have this, whether it's a DM's guide, whether it is a uh, the Game Mastery Guide, the general one for Savage Worlds that you can use for Deadlands and all the other ones as a guideline. And even in some of those, they have a, a GM's book. And so you really want to study it. What are th those tables? Now, I make a recommendation to all of you as GMs and DMs, please copy these pages with these actions and the descriptions. Why is it important? Because when your combat round comes up, you want those in a clear sheet of uh, sheet protector sitting in front of you so that if you've got any questions, you've got this. Sometimes they have them in the shields, like a GM shield. Sometimes they don't dive real deep into them and, and what comes with those. So I don't always trust those. And in fact, you can make your own custom one if you choose to. But you want to have these in front of you so that way if there's a question that comes up, with a standard round, you have the answers right there in front of you. Now, I will say this. Standard actions, there's a whole bunch of them. And some of them bleed over between move actions and standard actions. So keep that in mind. Uh, so, for your standard actions, any type of attack, whether it's melee, ranged, or unarmed, or like a natural attack, if you're in a beast form, or if you have a monster that's a beast, all of those fall into that type of, uh, of action. Uh, activating a magic item can either be done, um, well, actually, they put it mainly in the standard action, and I agree with that, versus a move action. So activating an item or other than a potion or oil, that is a standard action to do that. So if you've got a wand, if you've got some sort of a device, to so say as... In, in a sci-fi game, you have some sort of device that you're activating to get uh, an energy shield around you or something like that to protect you. That'll be a standard action in most cases. Um, aiding another. So say you've got another that needs aid either in a combat maneuver or they need aid regarding, and, and they also hit this as well, healing them. That is part of the standard actions. Casting a spell. So in most systems, casting a spell is a standard action. Now, some spells take a full round, so keep that in mind, and you're going to want to be able to go to the spell quickly that your players have. I put marks in your books of all where the spells are so you can easily turn to that and find where those spells are. Uh, always a good thing to do. Uh, channeling energy. Clerics have the abilities in a lot of systems to channel their god's energy or goddess's energy to heal. This can also be part of like a mutants and masterminds healing effect where you're channeling energy to heal another player. So keep that in mind that they have this and that this is a standard action when it comes to an action. Um, 
Another action that comes up is concentrating. So a lot of spell casters, or even in some systems, you have to concentrate on doing something. And so that takes a concentration skill check. That is generally a standard round, a standard action in a round. Um, dismissing a spell. So if you've got some sort of spell-like effect up, no matter your system, that's generally a standard action to fully dismiss that spell. Uh, drawing a hidden weapon. So <clears throat> if you're using a sleight of hand check or some sort of concealment check to bring a weapon that's concealed, that's a standard action in order to draw that weapon out. Um, drinking a potion or applying an oil, generally a standard action also in those kind of cases, or if you're doing a stim pack or something like that to help a player out to come back up hit points, that's generally a standard action. Next we look at a combat maneuver. So in this case it's escaping a grapple or a pin or some sort of a hold. In order to do that you need to take a standard action to make a check against uh, the opponent's defense to do that. If you're in Pathfinder, it's basically a CMD check against a CMD check. Um, so then there's also a maneuver called a feint. And I don't know if you're familiar with this. You may or may not be. A feint is basically acting like you're going to do an action. So in this case, in fencing, let's take a look at fencing. And, and it can be used not, no matter if it's fencing or some other combat art. You make a move like you're going to do a thrust at an opponent but instead then you pull back into a defensive mode because you want to draw the opponent into making a defensive maneuver to open them up for an attack this could be from a a friend or, an, or a fellow party member that's trying to do this sorry mini GM decides she wants to talk over DD um, so lighting a torch or lighting some sort of a uh, device so whether it's lighting up a lantern, lighting up a torch, lighting up a fire, standard action to do that. Uh, lower your spell resistance. Some systems have spell resistance, which they use against the enemy. And so if you want to lower that to allow somebody to heal you or do something positive to you, it's a standard round action. Um, reading a scroll or reading some sort of a message on a, on a pad. Uh, so say you've got a communication pad in some sort of game where you're being communicated to with some quick information. That's a standard round action. Um, readying or getting ready to ready an action for a round. That'll take one of your standard actions in order to do that. Um, stabilizing somebody who is dying. That's generally a standard action with some sort of a healing check or a, a skill or ability. So, you know, whether it be somebody saying using your wisdom check, it's a wisdom check, an intelligence check, a dex check, whatever it is for the system, that's going to take that standard round action. Providing a total defense. So say you're not going to strike an opponent, but you're going to defend to try to feint off an opponent's attack so you don't get damaged. You can do that, and a lot of players forget about that, and as do GMs. You don't always have to make a devastating attack. You can do a feint. To, or you can do a defense to keep them from hitting you. If you want to use some extraordinary ability or power, when you're using that extraordinary ability or activating it, it generally takes a standard round action in order to do that. Um, using a skill that takes one action, normally, so a perfect example, you want to roll through an opponent's uh, attack of opportunity area and not get hit. So you want to do some sort of an acrobatics roll through there. So you do an acrobatics check. If you succeed the DC of that acrobatics check, that's a standard round action to do. Uh, using a spell-like ability. So if a creature is triggering a spell-like ability, a lot of devils, demons, outworldly creatures, magical creatures... Uh, outsiders have spell-like abilities that act like a spell but aren't. They're just a triggerable ability. And so that takes a standard round action. And then a supernatural ability. So you're bringing in something, so say like you're doing a mental attack on a, a opponent. That's usually a standard action. 
So these are some examples of that. They dive a little more in the books under the descriptions of these, but get familiar with them because they're going to be things that are going to get contested by players in your system, and they're going to bring it up, and they're going to challenge you from time to time on it. So knowing that's going to be really important. Next come the move actions. The move actions are pretty straightforward. It can be a, just a general move. It could be trying to control a frightened mount. Uh, it can be directing or redirecting an active spell at another creature. So in some cases, in some systems, they've got things called spiritual weapons. So you would redirect a spiritual weapon at another opponent. That takes a move action. Drawing a weapon. If you don't have a feat in your system or, or a special thing called a quick draw, generally drawing a weapon takes a full round action. Or not a full round, but a move action. Sorry. Uh, loading... A device, loading something. So it could be loading a gun, it could be loading a laser thing with a new cell, it could be loading a crossbow um, bolt into a crossbow. The loading action itself takes a move action to do. Opening and closing a door in combat, that's a move action. Uh, dismounting a steed or dismounting a motorcycle, a move action. Or a, a sky cycle, you can go through a ton of different Vehicles. Dismounting a vehicle you're mounted on, normally a move action. Uh, picking up an item is a move action. Lifting a heavy object off the ground to, to toss it at an opponent or carry it away is a move action. Sheathing a weapon, standing up from being prone is a move action. Readying or dropping a shield, move action. And then retrieving a stored item somewhere on your body is a move action. So anything of this type of like is going to be a move action. So your characters get one of each action in a round. Now, some actions are full round actions. So like a full attack. And what does that mean? Say your system allows you multiple attacks. That is considered a full attack. A full round action. You get a five foot step after that. But generally that's all you get. And, and that is it. So to do those now, say your player doesn't want to take all of those. They just want to do one of their attacks and then a full move. That's fine, too. But it's an either-or option. There are some abilities. So, like a, a strike back or a, um, a uh, uh, um, kinda, I'm thinking on this, a cleave, a greater cleave. They take a full round action. Versus like a regular, you're cleaving one opponent to go to the next one, hitting one opponent to go to the next. They'll generally term it a cleave, and that's like a standard action. But a greater cleave where you're striking multiple opponents and keep striking and striking and striking, that's going to be a greater cleave, which takes a full round action. Uh, a coup de gras. So say your opponent is incapacitated. You've put them under a hold spell, you've done something really powerful to just, you know, subdue them to where they can't act. A coup de gras, basically a cutting of the throat or, or putting a bullet in them, is a full round action. Escaping from a net. So say you get hit by a net by some vehicle or somebody throws a net on you as a gladiator or you get hit with a web spell. To get out of that, it takes a full round to remove yourself from that. Um, extinguishing a flame. So an area somebody catches on fire. They, say they catch your vehicle on fire and you don't want it to blow up. It takes a full round action of trying to use something to douse those flames. Lighting a torch. Um, again, if you're doing it from scratch where you're pulling the torch out, putting some, putting the oil on it, and then lighting it. That is a full round action. Uh, loading a repeating crossbow. That's different than a regular crossbow. Repeating crossbows have the long clips. Same way with a gun that has an extended clip. If you're going to reload your bullets into that, that's a full round action to reload an empty clip. Uh, lock or unlock a weapon in your gauntlet or somewhere else in your body. Say you've got a locked weapon or a locked item that you don't want somebody stealing or pilfering. You want to make it hard on them to get. That takes a full round to unlock it. Um, preparing a splash weapon. So, Molotov cocktails or a, a, a vial of oil where you're putting a piece of cloth into it to light it and then lighting it. 
that's a full round action to get that all ready to go. Running. So going at, at way above your normal speed uh, to get somewhere. If you want to run to get to an opponent that's just out of your normal walk range or, or a quick, you know, burst of speed up that you got to do a full on run, that takes a full action, round action. Um, using a skill that takes a round. There are some skills that take a whole round to do. So you have to check in those and see what their duration is. But there are those that do do that. Um, using a touch spell on multiple friends to try to help them. So you're trying to do a touch that heals multiple people or affects multiple people. That's a full round action. Withdrawing totally out of combat in a safe way so that you don't get attacked. That withdraw takes a full round action. It means you're being very defensive. You're, you're watching for opponents to hit you. That is a full round action. Some systems also have free actions, swift actions, and immediate actions. Swift actions are basically like ceasing to concentrate on a spell, dropping an item in your hand, dropping prone to the floor, um, getting co spell components ready or some components ready to do some sort of supernatural action, speaking to someone. Those are considered free actions. They don't cost you or penalize you in your round. Um, swift actions, they don't penalize you either necessarily, but there's a little bit difference in the fact, like for instance, if you're trying to, you have a thing called quicken spell, and you can quicken your spells casting, in order to prepare and do that, it takes what's called a swift action. And then an immediate action. So say you got knocked off a cliff, and you want to activate an item that will let you float down. You're doing it, and you're wearing that item. That is called an immediate action. You can immediately call that into play. And there's some other actions that they'll have in there. But knowing these actions is really important. And why is that? Because you want combat to flow as quickly as you can. Now, some of these actions are going to bring what's called an attack of opportunity. So say you are within 30 feet of your opponent and you pull your gun to fire on them. Well, you're in range for them to hit back at you because you're doing your action of firing and you're concentrating and you're not defending yourself. So that opens you up. If somebody's standing next to you and you're firing at a person 30 feet away, that brings an attack of opportunity on you. You are not defending yourself against that opponent that's right there. Or if you're doing it at one right in front of you, well, they can knock your gun away. They can do other things. That's why it's called an attack of opportunity. They're trying to respond to your attack to keep you from killing them. So it is called an attack of opportunity. You've opened yourself up. You are not paying attention to defending yourself. You have no means of easily defending yourself when you're doing that action. That's an attack of opportunity action. And they list them out in a lot of these things. Now, keep in mind that when you're doing these things, there's other complicated things that you can do in a row. And so round things are very important, but also understanding. And, and they've got some great charts. Like in a lot of the books, they'll put a chart that will explain attacks of opportunity. Get to know that. That's, you know, for you Pathfinders that are tuning in, page 181 of the Core Rulebook has that. It's not a bad page to print and, again, have with you and ready to go. Now, another thing that always happens in a round. So say an opponent casts something on you that has an area of effect that you can use a um, saving throw to avoid. Saving throws are part of a round, and generally they are an ability score plus whatever that level of that class gives you in defense to that, plus any magic items, so cloaks of resistance, other type of items that afford you to, to do better at your check on your save of that. Make sure that you have that in there and add that in when your players are doing. Size modifiers. Does size matter? Oh, of course it does. And I'm not meaning that in a derogatory way. Size affects how much more you get damaged, how much easier you are to be hit, or how hard you are to hit. It's harder to hit a flying little sprite or fairy than it is to hit a hill giant. You know, come on. One's so obviously easy to hit. Now, they may have thicker skin, which helps them. But you're hitting something large, so you're much easier to do that. Well, remember, you're larger to some smaller opponents, so for them to hit you, you've got to take that into account as well. And there's tables for that. Again, for the Pathfinders, they have that on page 179 of the Core Rulebook. 
So it's something you want to look at. Um, what happens if you are disabled, injured, or, or die? You've got to keep those things in mind. For most systems, when you're taken to zero hit points or zero health points or whatever they call it, you are incapacitated. You're still able to do some little things, but any major amount of movement is going to cause you to bleed out and die. So you're limited in what you can do. Some classes give you features like a rage effect, which overcomes this, or some spells give you that. Keep that in mind so that the players cast those like Death Knell or some other things. You know what's going on to keep you healthy. Um, dying. When you go negative, you are no longer conscious and you're dying. In a lot of systems, they'll give you a roll to try to stabilize every round which means you're, you're bleeding, but you're not bleeding out quickly. That's a stabilize check. Or somebody can heal you to get you back to zero to stabilize you. Normally, dead or death is when you go below your fortitude score, your, your health, or your constitution score, whatever the ability is that affects your overall health and hit points. When you go negative that, you are dead. And generally... Anything short of a god stepping in, some sort of a revivication chamber, or some sort of reviving spell like a raised dead, or a resurrection, or reincarnation, you're not getting up. Now it's up to you as a GM whether you want to allow a player to have some sort of divine intervention that brings them back. I've done that before in a couple of my sessions. Um, in one case, a cleric asked help to revive the dead paladin. In another case, the dead paladin ran into his god while going off to die. I wouldn't make that a, a hard, fast rule for your players. I would allow that at times, and generally I make it a rule that they've got like maybe a 15 or 20% chance on percent dice, the D10s, for that to occur. That's up to you as a house rule. For me, it's a house rule. I do that because then the system isn't all about killing the party. It, it's about the story, and in some cases, I will do something to aid them in this. Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing is movements and distance. You want to know tactical distance. A great way that one of my players has done, and I love it, sometimes players want to move in a jig-jag fashion. So what you do to calculate what is the real distance is you take a ruler. Every 12 inches is a 5-foot so you count out the inches for how many five-foot moves they can do, and, and the resulting effect is where that is. Um, so keep that in mind. Obstacles. They do, in some cases, characters get bonuses for hiding behind things, or, or monsters, or baddies, or NPCs, or whatever you want to call them. So they're hiding behind a wall. They're hiding behind a car. They're hiding on the other side of a window. They're hiding prone on the ground so they can't get hit. There are positives and negatives to the armor class as well as the combat rules. So keep that in mind. Sometimes putting yourself and aiming on a wall when you're firing at an opponent, especially with a crossbow or a firearm, steadies you and gives you bonuses because you're not as, as random with kicks and the, and the wind to be affected by the shot. So keep that in mind. There's For Pathfinders, page 195 in the core rulebook is really key. Find that in your core books. Again, another page to print out and have with you. So that way you can make combat modifiers go really easy. Um, you can do maneuvers. A lot of systems have maneuvers. I know Pathfinder does, and I love that for that. Combat maneuvers are what they call CMBs. Okay? You want to do something special to... Do something to your opponent while you're hitting them. Say you want to trip them. Say you want to disarm them. Say you want to bull rush them and knock them down. Um, overrun them. Sunder their weapons. Uh, trip them. Uh, basically, those type of things. Knock a weapon out of their hand. That is going to be a roll of an attack of some form against the opponent's defense. How they do it in Pathfinder is pretty straightforward. They do your CMB is basically your base attack bonus 
plus your strength modifier, plus any size modifiers that play in. Your CMD, your defense, combat maneuver defense, is 10. It starts out always at a base 10, plus your attack bonus, plus your strength, plus your dex, plus size modifiers. So keep that in mind. I love that because it's always trying to figure out, are you is one going to overcome another? And in some cases, it's really easy. Um, mounted combat. Mounted combat is a lot more difficult, and there's negatives to it. So keep in mind. And look up what those are. In some cases, if you've got the ability to uh, ride, some of them have a ride ability or a drive ability under the skills. That helps you as a bonus to keep you from not blowing a shot at an opponent. Let's face it, moving, it's not easy to do a shot unless you're real good at it. Um, readying. So if you're ready in action, but you don't want to do it, so say the initiative rolls come up. You get your rounds in initiative. Bob is first. Well, Bob wants to wait three people down until he sees what the monster's going to do, and then he's going to go on the same round as the monster. So he waits and readies. No problem. You go through your other things in the round, and you come to that creature. Then you look at their dexterity versus Bob's dexterity. Whoever's got the better dexterity goes first with their action. Now, in the combat order, Bob moves down to the monster's action, and that's when they go from that point on. Anytime they ready an action, when they take that action is where they are from now on in the combat. So keep that in mind. Those are all kind of important things when it comes to combat. And I think, you know, some other things, if you want to look at Sundering, 175 in the Pathfinder core rulebook gives you hardness versus hit points and the DC to break. So you can roll your DC check against with your Sunder roll, and if it overcomes that and it overcomes the hit points and the hardness, then it breaks and you sundered the item. That's pretty cool, especially like when you're using a katana versus a longsword and you sunder the sword or you sunder the armor and, and the armor's effectiveness goes down making it easier to hit the opponent. These are maneuvers that don't always get used in combat because they're kind of, in people's mind, boring. No, they're not. <laughs> they're something that can aid the combat, and, and I would use it as a GM against your players. Uh, your, your opponents want to survive. So I hope this helps, and I hope this is a little bit better. I'm going to call this part two of my uh, what goes on in a combat round, plus a little dive into some of the effects. Of, of some of the items you can do in a combat. Important things that make play a lot of fun and very enriching. Again, this isn't social combat. That's a whole other story we'll do another day. But this is physical combat and understanding it. And when you do, you're going to make your play go a lot faster. So become very familiar with things. Uh, I, I recommend if the players are willing to share their character sheets with you so you know their abilities and get to know them so that when they try these abilities, you know how to help them or how to make them understand it better so that they don't take advantage of something and, and do something that's really fairly impossible. Uh, thanks, and I hope you have a great rest of the week of gaming. Take care, and this is GM Rick signing out.